There you go. So that is recording, which is the thing I say at every um, at start of every video. But um, yeah, hello everyone. For those who don't know, I'm Tim. I'm an introductory type person here at um, the Old Sword Club, which I guess is kind of like being the dungeon master of fencing lessons in like a using a and D analogy, like a Dungeons and Dragons analogy, not anything else. Um, but yeah, so tonight we're going to look at um, Dueling Sword or Early Epe, uh, which um, is kind of interesting thing. So the reason I call it Dueling Sword is um, Epe is just French for sword, um, but in the period that in um, the 19th century in Britain, they referred to it as Dueling Sword, they don't use the term Epe, which seems to be something that kind of came into, came into fashion in the 20th century. And I want to distinguish it a little bit from uh, modern Olympic fencing, much as it's maybe not as different from modern Olympic fencing as a lot of people maintain. Uh, certainly a lot of female practitioners like to really emphasize the, dif uh, the difference between historical fencing and modern fencing, but a lot of that difference actually comes down to the weapons being used rather than, um, you know, necessarily the style. Um, but certainly, like, I do maintain this if you are an Olympic fencer, this is something very, very useful for you to do. Um, in the same way that, you know, like with any combat sport, you want to look at how it was done over a long period. Um, you know, like a lot of, I mean, a lot of top athletes talk about getting influence from, um, you know, old manuals from systems that were, you know, even a hundred years before them. Um, you know, Jack Dempsey's actually come, become very, very fashionable again with boxers and also with mixed martial arts, kind of for that reason. Uh, but anyway, so the weapon we're using uh, is this sort of thing which is, this is my rough mock-up of an early epé, um, because it wasn't until sort of the mid 20th century that they started to have these kind of off-sided guards. Um, you know, and also um, the one, a lot of the ones in the late 19th century had just straight handles. So I kind of threw this together from, um, you know, modern fencing equipment, but it looks relatively similar to the period ones. Um, and the, Method for this has also been kind of interesting to put together because there's not any epi manuals that are just, here's what to do. They're all uh, manuals that reference foil fencing. Um, and foil fencing has been around for a very long time. So like, you know, in like, you know, even into late eight, like the late, mid to late 1800s, you have what is essentially recognizable as foil fencing. Um, which I find really interesting is a lot of um, in practitioners say that the thing that changed fencing um, and to make it less combative and more sportive was that um, people stopped actually fighting with swords. But in a period where swords were used for duels, where they were used for um, in warfare, um, you know, even in the 1800s where they were still being used for self-defense to some extent, you still get this very, very sportive, you know, limited targets. Um, rules that change how you can do technique in a way that maybe not particularly applicable to life or death duel um you know for and that's around for quite some time that's not really until the late 19th century that a lot of people started saying hang on there's all these stories and i've seen all these instances um of people doing uh like skilled or skilled foil fences fighting duels and losing to people who have had you know, very, very little fencing training. And so um, what they started doing is they started developing um, specific, a specific style of fencing that is meant to be a much better simulation of a duel to better prepare people for the duel. And um, this is something sort of, I think this also kind of plays into what Chris Lee was talking about uh, a couple of weeks ago in his lecture, which is up on the Old Soul Club. I think it, it will hopefully be up on our YouTube channel soon once, I, once YouTube actually lets me access the YouTube channel again. Um, but if you can, you want to get some more context for the sort of fencing we're doing tonight, that talk is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, scandalous comments about Alfred Hutton aside. Um, but yeah, so we're going to look at, or we're going to look at a system that is basically part foil fencing, um, part, and then wholly sort of all of what, you know, the FA manual say to do. So to kind of put this together, I've basically had to go through read up on foil fencing and then go, okay, well, this is how this applies to the EPA. This is how, how this applies to, you know, what, what um, these EPA menus are telling you to do. Um, and this kind of, I don't know, which is kind of a fun exercise for me, um, doubly so because um, up until very recently, a lot of the manual, a lot of EPA manuals were exclusively in French. 
and they're referenced in English, um, like in English sources constantly. But that's just because like English people, like the British at the time, the British gentleman at the time, um, was expected to speak multiple languages. And one of the best languages to learn in the period was, um, was actually French. So like Alfred Hutton references um, Jules Jacob's manual, which is one of the premier sort of FA manuals, and says, you know, this is a really good thing to read. And, you know, it, um, just if you want to learn FA, go read this. Um, but it's never, it wasn't translated into English until fairly recently. Hutton just kind of expects that his audience will know, will, um, will know French, or at least will be able to, or be in communities where enough people know French that you can, that someone can get them, um, get Jules Jacob's manual and um, translate lessons. Um, so just before I launch into, like, start the sort of the technical lesson proper, I'm going to pause recording. Um, I'm going to